Hi again. Today I want to take a second look at calorimetry, this time dealing with solutions. When we conduct calorimetry experiments in a solution, what we can visualize is that the reaction takes place, or the reacting system, as a series of boxes or cubes, and inside those boxes, that's where our two reactants get together and generate their heat, or absorb their heat. In this case, A and B get together to make C at all of these locations throughout the solution. The total amount of heat then exchanged with the surroundings would be generated by the number of moles of our limiting chemical times the molar enthalpy change associated with either A or B. The surroundings in this particular case is the water itself. The mass of water, its specific heat, and delta T can all be used to measure the enthalpy change of the water. So in this case, the water acts as the surroundings, and the system is sort of mixed in throughout that water. I'll make a few assumptions. Um, again, we're going to assume that all the heat that's exchanged is done with the water itself and not the glass or the air. And also, the presence of these chemicals in the water itself doesn't alter its density or its specific heat capacity. So, the change then associated with my system the change associated with the surroundings must total zero. That's the conservation of energy. If the amount of energy in the universe remains constant, then the total amount of changes must be equal to zero. Let's work through an example that shows this. We're going to find out the heat of neutralization from mixing together an acid and a base. So here I start off with 50 cubic centimeters of 0.1 molar sulfuric acid. A second beaker at exactly the same temperature and same volume, I have 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide. We're going to take these two beakers, pour their contents together into a larger container, and we see a small temperature change that takes place. Here's my governing equation to determine the enthalpy change. And the first thing I'd like you to notice here is that the number of moles deals with the limiting chemical. I can get the number of moles of sulfuric acid, I can get the number of moles of um, sodium hydroxide. Which one of these is the limiting chemical? Well, let's take a look at the balanced chemical equation for a moment. Here I can see that one sulfuric acid requires two sodium hydroxides. If I look up at the information I'm given, I have equal number of moles of sulfuric acid and an equal number of moles of sodium hydroxide. I know that because I have the same volumes and the same concentrations. The fact that I have the same amount of moles of both chemicals would suggest to me that I'm going to run out of sodium hydroxide because I require two of them for every one of the acid. So I can see by inspection that's my limiting chemical. For those of you that want a more rigorous approach, let's put a little math to it. I'm going to calculate the moles of each of my chemicals, which happens to be 0 0.0050 moles. Using those, I'm going to determine the amount of product I can make, in this case, say, water. Using the sodium hydroxide, I can make 0 0.005 water. And if I use the sulfuric acid, I can make 0 0.01 moles per liter, uh, moles, sorry, of water. Rule is, you always make the smaller of the two amounts. And so that traces back to the sodium hydroxide. So either way, I know that sodium hydroxide is my limiting chemical. So using that particular value for my limiting chemical, delta H is what I need to figure out. The mass of water, again, I'm assuming the density of water is 1, and I get 100 grams of water, specific heat capacity of water, 4.18, and the temperature change of my solution. Again, I can use Celsius because changes of temperature in Celsius and Kelvin are the same magnitude. Anyway, solving for that expression, I get this answer, negative 50,160 joules. Now, my final answer is supposed to be in kilojoules, so I'll need to divide that by 1,000, and also express it with the appropriate number of significant digits. Well, let's take a look at what that would be. If I take a look at my moles of substance, it has two significant digits. My 100 grams has three, 4.18 has three, and if I take a look carefully at my temperature change, once you subtract those two numbers, you get 0.6, which has one significant digit. So I must round off my answer to one significant digit, which I do here by using an exponent or power of 10. Again, I get a negative answer, indicating it's an exothermic reaction. Now, it says per mole, and that's going to be per mole of sodium hydroxide, my limiting chemical. Let's evaluate some of the things in this experiment. 
First off, there's the experimental value I obtained, unrounded. And if I consult the literature, I should get negative 55.8 kilojoules. It means that my percentage error is about 10%. Here are some things that could lead to that problem. First of all, again, the assumption that all of the heat moves into the water. That's a systematic error because some of the heat could have also moved into the glass beaker. So I should, if I want to get a more accurate answer, include the mass of the glass beaker and its temperature change in heat capacity. Its temperature change would be the same as that of the water. Also, the way that I measured the final temperature was simply taking the highest temperature reached, uh, 22.6. It would have been better to plot data of time and temperature, much like I did in the previous film or previous video, and extrapolate to determine the final temperature. That would give me a more accurate answer. I could also insulate the container or use a styrofoam cup, which would be an improvement um, in its ability to uh, uh, retain the heat. The other thing I should notice here is a tremendous lack of precision in my experiment, only one significant digit, which was governed by my temperature change. If I could get a bigger temperature change, I could get more precision. The way to get a bigger temperature change is to reduce perhaps the volumes of my liquids to 25 milliliters of each one, thereby probably getting almost twice the temperature change, 1.2 degrees, which improves my significant digits by one. The mass of the water also does slightly increase at this experiment. As you can see from uh, the data, that uh, water is a product. So essentially that product that's being made is also going to absorb some heat and perhaps could be included uh, to improve the accuracy of my answer. And finally, the assumption that the solutes present, the sulfuric acid, the sodium hydroxide, the salt at the end of the uh, sodium sulfate at the end of the experiment, we assume that these don't alter the heat capacity of the substance or the density, perhaps at least doing some initial experiments to see how density is altered or specific heat capacity is altered by these salts could improve my answer. So again, I hope that you've watched both of these programs. It gives you two techniques that you can use to measure calorimetry experiments. Questions are always welcome.